It's a monster fish. Watch out. Let him go. This right here is going to help us understand how the shark moves around for six years. Anybody got a radio? So we'll be able to get all this cord off of her. She was all wrapped up in a long line. We've been out there cutting the long line oh, off that's of her. Right. Oh, there's a big, powerful, mean shark right there. Careful now, one at a time. See the stone flies on the rock? Hey, shark on! Never give up! I think I saw a scene like this once before. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Fisher. Cheers. 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 All right. How are you guys doing out there? Good? You guys doing all right? Yeah. I'm happy to be here. It uh, was just a coincidence that I happened to be in South Africa, so it's perfect timing to be here. Um, my name is Chris Fisher, and uh, I'm a Kentucky boy. Kentucky's kind of a rural state in the United States. I grew up fishing and running around in the woods and forests of Kentucky, really um, fell in love with the water and the resource there. Um, it's really amazing to me how the rivers and streams of Kentucky have led me to the ocean the way they have, and I think it really just began with a passion for the resource and a passion for the water, as well as, you know, leadership at home. I had amazing parents, so I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, a taste of what it was like at the dinner table when I was growing up. You know, Chris, ideas are interesting, but execution is everything. Chris, do you know what the biggest room in the world is? Do you guys know what the biggest room in the world is? All the massive buildings around the world. Does anybody know what the biggest room in the world is? The room for improvement. <laughs> Welcome to my dinner table. <laughs> you know, so all these things, you know. Uh, you got to get naked with yourself, Chris. Do you really like what you see when you look in the mirror? Do you know who you are? Are you good with that? You know, if you can see it and visualize it, you can make it happen. Anything is possible. So I had amazing parents, you know. And uh, a funny story of how we got here, I think a little bit to help you understand what motivates me and how we're making things happen, is the self-serve beverage machine. My brothers and I, when we were kids, we invented the self-serve soda machine. So every time when you get a soda, a big gulp, or you go to a hotel and you press a button that puts ice in a bucket, that was me and my brothers taking a bankrupt company when we were kids and turning it into the largest privately held beverage self-serve beverage manufacturing company for Coke and Pepsi on a global scale. Now, it wasn't that big of a company at the time, but it was the vision. It was the entrepreneurial mindset of being able to make anything happen and being able to dream big. And in late 97, we started this journey with this company in 1980. In late 97, a public company, I came home. I was working in Asia. I went to school in Singapore. And uh, I came home one day, and they were like, it's over. And I was 29 years old. I was like, oh my God, I can't screw this up. I have no idea. I thought I was going to do that the rest of my life. It wasn't a big deal, but it, it gave me a little bit of dough to start pursuing my passion again that had started in Kentucky. I was living in California, managing our family's business in Asia, and I was spending a lot of time on the water in Southern California, in Baja, in Mexico, on the Pacific. Met my wife, Melissa, around the year 2000. And we started exploring a little bit more around Baja, off deep, deep, far, far away, going out on 10 and 12 and 20-day trips, and we'd come home from those trips, and we'd talk to our friends in Southern California about these amazing things that we saw on the ocean, and these things that really kind of scared us, because they were terrible. And they would be like, that's cool, whatever, let's go out and party and have dinner. And we were like, wow, really? I mean, if you live on the beach, and you don't care about what's going on on the ocean, what about the people who live in Kentucky, where I came from, or Iowa, or any inland place? So we just became alarmed that people did not have their own relationship with the ocean. So we started a company. We started a production company called Fisher, Fisher Productions, and its sole mission was to pour the world's oceans into people's homes through their TV sets. So they could have their own relationship with the ocean. They could have their own awareness level, because that awareness creates passion and, and, you know, and a desire to look after something. So we started this show called Offshore Adventures, which was about my wife and I adventuring with our family, and we raised our kids on the boat. I, I miss my family. I've been on the water for a while. I haven't seen them. That's little Sarah. She's now seven. And we made 188 episodes of Offshore Adventures, and it always ended with a steward, stewardship message. Get out, discover the world offshore, be a responsible steward of the sea. And so it was a good venue. We began to leverage it with about 50 million domestic viewers in America to start affecting policy. Uh, I started working a lot with politicians. I started, I was on the board of the Bill Fish Foundation, still am, but had tens of millions of viewers that I was trying to 
use almost as constituents to create awareness and then leverage the TV gig to get meetings with policymakers to affect change. But I had the fishermen already. I was basically preaching to the choir. And when I say fishermen, I'm talking about recreational fishermen, not commercial fishermen. So we started to think about if we want to affect great change and we want to increase the scale of our vision, we, we can't really be the ESPN fishing guy. We have to be the global ocean explorer, the a generational explorer of our time. And so we started out here and we began to try to think about after 188 episodes, how can we grow and expand? So we started helping the science community, uh, even in the late years of offshore adventures, helping them understand the movement of apex predators and billfish and tagging them and funding them and helping them get out on the water because they're really challenged with resources and the capacity to get out there actually on the water and affect chains and explode the body of knowledge forward. So one, while we were working on some billfish research, one of the guys happened to be a white shark scientist. And he said, I got this permit to put this spot tag on a white shark, but no one's ever really been able to figure out how to catch one and let it go alive. And I thought, oh, that's interesting, but I'm not really the shark guy, so whatever. So I started then thinking about sharks, because he kept coming back to me, and I was like, wow, what's up with all the shark stuff, you know? Um, and started to realize how important sharks were, but they had a perception problem. You know, they have this Jaws perception problem that they are uh, feared, you know, and we don't know anything about their lives because they're difficult to manage, and because of that, this unknown creates fear, but the reality is we're wiping them off the face of the planet for a bowl of soup, and that's a bad trade. So when you remove an apex predator, it has all sorts of ripple effects. You guys know that. I'm preaching to the choir here. But eliminating the sharks, the great balance keeper, the moderator of the ocean, has all these radical ripple effects. And I began to understand this a little bit more and started to get more interested in trying to understand how I could help. But it was difficult to know how to protect them because we don't understand much about their lives. And I quickly began to understand that we don't understand most of the giant things in the ocean because the leading thought makers, the researchers, have never been able to get their hands on a live, mature specimen and let it go alive. And until you can do that, you can't solve the puzzle of multi-year migratory loops. You can't do hormone assays to understand if a, if a specimen is reproductively ripe right now and start to put together the life history puzzles. So there was this big knowledge gap. Um, and there was not much time. Sharks are getting harvested at a rate that they cannot sustain. You know, you all know in this room, it takes a long time for them to become mature. They have a few babies. It's very easy to wipe them out and cut off the reproductive cycle. And we had a knowledge gap. You know, everyone had gotten to a certain, port, a certain point in knowledge. We were stuck. We had to get our hands on some live mature specimens and then have the capacity to let them go alive, to explode the body of knowledge forward again. So we began looking around and trying to understand how can we help. So it was time to kind of upgrade. I, I bumped into this guy in a cove in Costa Rica who had this ship, and he was using it as a mothership to carry around game boats and fish remote corners of the earth and had this unique lift on it, and he was ready to get out from under it. So I bought it on a handshake in Costa Rica and then went home and leveraged everything I had, put a second mortgage on my house, sold everything, and was trying to figure out how to muster this up to get something good going. It had this unique lift. This lift can pick up 55,000 pounds out of the water with one degree of list. So all of a sudden, it starts to used to, used to start flowing. You think, maybe this can make the impossible possible. There was no book on how to do this. We decided we would support the research, my wife and I. And we headed out to Guadalupe to try and capture a white shark and let it go alive. And there was no book on how to do this. No one knew what was going to happen, but we knew we had to try and bring communities together that hadn't worked and hadn't, you know, they'd worked together in the past, but maybe not at this scale. So I was really focusing on trying to bring world-class fishermen and mariners together with world-class researchers. And by doing that, we could explode the body of knowledge forward. And I always laughed, you know, I would come in, I've been working with Pete Klimley a lot lately, Dr. Bob Huter, um, and always when I introduce him to Captain Brett McBride or Captain Jody Whitworth, I'll be like, you know, Bob, this is uh, Brett McBride. Brett, you know, Bob's got a PhD in marine biology. And then I'd be like, hey, Bob, Brett has got a PhD in fishology. I recommend you two guys put your minds together and take that practical knowledge together with that book knowledge, and we will explode things forward. And that's exactly what's happening right now. 
So how do we push the body of knowledge forward? We knew if we got the right people together and the right equipment, the right assets, we could probably do that if we operated in an environment of mutual um, respect. We had to pull off three things. We had to spot tag them, we had to check for sperm samples, and we had to get blood samples. The spot tags obviously solve the puzzle of multi-year migrations. The blood samples, hormone assays. Sperm present, would that line up with the hormones? So we determined at Guadalupe Island that that was actually a breeding aggregation, not a feeding site. And if we knew that, we figured that out with the blood, then if we got a spot tag on there in a mature female bred, 18 months later, she should lead us to the holy grail of white shark science there, and that would be the birthing ground. So this is Amy. Amy was the largest fish ever caught, ever. She still is today. Um, she was released alive, and she turned out to be the most important shark that we ever tagged. She was about 16 and a half feet long and 16 and a half feet around. And uh, conventional theory said that she was actually eating at Guadalupe, was going to breed out in the middle of the ocean and give birth in the Channel Islands. But once we did our hormone assays, we determined we knew she was breeding at Guadalupe and that she would go out to the middle of the ocean and feed with all the other sharks. You can see those are aggregation sites. That's Guadalupe, the lower one, and up at the top, that's the Farallon. So all the sharks tagged at these aggregation sites head out to what's called the sofa and uh, out at the shared offshore foraging area, not like a couch. <laughs> and... Uh, and they feed out there. We followed six sharks out there. They were mixed in with big pods of sperm whales gorging on squid, which was another breakthrough because they thought most mature sharks had only ate mammals. They spend the majority of their time out there eating squid. And then the males return every year to the aggregation site. But what was Amy going to do? Theoretically, 18 months after she left, she was going to not go back to Guadalupe. She was going to go give birth. And everyone said it was going to be the Channel Islands of California, and what Amy did is groundbreaking. She dropped down to the south, swung up into the Sea of Cortez, went all the way up to the Sea of Cortez, and dropped off her pup. So we tracked her up there. And while we were up there, we went and looked at commercial fishing camps and their dumps and started to find baby young of the year white sharks dead mummified in the desert there in Baja. And so this was groundbreaking. This was thousands of miles from where they said she was going to give birth. So, you know, what are we going to do with that sort of information? Well. What we've done in, in Mexico, which has been powerful, we funded the research, we, we developed the groundbreaking data, we got that data, and we've now affected policy, because if the white shark is a treasure at Guadalupe, it needs to be a treasure in the Sea of Cortez, too, for the Mexican people. So now we've shut down shark fishing during the birthing season in the Sea of Cortez. So that's kind of a groundbreaking thing to approach an aggregation site, rewrite the life history, take the new data, and actually affect the policy, which is really what we're trying to do here. This I just put up for you guys. This is kind of a look at the scale of data we're getting from the 20 sharks there at Guadalupe. This one I just threw in because we're here locally. We're currently, we brought the ship over here. It took 42 days. We're putting $2.7 million into the South African resource uh, during the months of March and April. Um, and we have, yeah, yeah. And so this is the largest shark research project in South African history with about over 10 institutions, 30 researchers. We're putting 60 tags out. We have about 28 tags out now. This was just after one week of data and 12 sharks. This, no one's seen this before. I just had the scientists put it together on the ship last night before I left. But you can see that we're already finding new little hot spots and new little places where the white sharks are piling up that they were unaware of. So it's kind of amazing how instant the information is. Pardon me. So my approach, entrepreneurial mindset, you know, can we develop private businesses that generate the funding to push things forward? And so all of my organizations have a mission. For Fisher Productions, we produce thought-provoking media that benefits people or the planet, or we don't do it. So I develop these businesses, get somebody to pay me to do something, take about half the money and fund research, and the rest develop a product to spread the word on a global level. So really trying to make these three companies come together to work the production company, the research vessel, and, and the nonprofit, all surrounding the resource, resource driven, you know, really breaking down this individual institutions with their own agendas, battling for their own money. If you want to come to work, we'll fund things, but we must collaborate. We must change the model. So at Fisher Productions, if we can develop global scale, we can inspire the next generation. We can generate the revenue to fund the research. On the, on the OSEARCH, the research vessel, we are catching and releasing the uncatchable to collect the uncollectable data. And then to push it over the line into the end zone, we take that data to our nonprofit, leverage the global TV Explorer gig thing, 
and command the meeting with the policymaker and take that data to affect future policy. And that is, you know, taking it from the first dollar all the way to closing out the policy, all surrounding resource-based decisions, avoiding individual agendas, and not caring who gets the credit. All of this to eliminate a bowl of soup and shut down the Finning Mafia. This has got a dark side to it, the Finning Mafia. I'm sure many of you all realize this. It's impacted my life personally. Um, the same people who are finning are also smuggling people and drugs and everything else. It's a dark world, and they count on that darkness to get by with what they do. But we can leverage TV to affect generational change. Young people change. It's no different than getting people to think about their diet. We can influence the next generation, even if we've got to wait out the old timers. But, you know, <laughs> it's going to take a little while. So, you know, really the question is, what is the balance of the ocean worth? What if we change the model for how businesses, science, and nonprofits work together? What if we no longer worked individually as research institutions or nonprofits and we all put the resource first? So the people that have different pieces of the puzzle came together and solved the big puzzle. What if nobody cared who got credit? What if pushing the body of knowledge forward for the resource was everyone's number one priority? That's powerful. My name is Chris Fisher. I'm an explorer pioneering research on the Ocean Giants to advocate for their future. Thank you for your time.